For more than a decade before the American Revolution, tensions between the American colonies and the British authorities had been mounting. Up until 1764, the British had for the most part left the 13 colonies to govern themselves. However, victory in the French and Indian Wars of 1756-63 had left the crown short of cash. Thus, in an attempt to recoup its revenue, the British government introduced a series of taxes on the colonies, such as the Stamp Act of 1765, the Townshend's Acts of 1767, and the infamous Tea Act of 1773. These new taxes were met with heated protests by the colonial population, who resented their lack of representation in Parliament, and protesters could frequently be heard chanting, no taxation without representation at rallies. Momentum for action soon followed, and in 1765, a group of protesters formed the infamous Sons of Liberty in Boston, and rallied support to their cause. Protests frequently popped up throughout New England over the next five years. However, they would eventually turn violent when on March 5th, 1770, British soldiers opened fire on a crowd outside the old state house in Boston, killing five men in the process in what would be known as the Boston Massacre. This only fueled the flames of rebellion further, and on December 16th, 1773, in retaliation for the Tea Act, Many members of the Sons of Liberty disguised themselves as Mohawk Indians and boarded three British merchant ships in Boston Harbour, where they proceeded to dump 342 crates of tea into the sea during the Boston Tea Party. Infuriated, the British swiftly sought retribution and in 1774 they imposed the intolerable acts upon the local population. These new acts severely damaged the colony's commerce and trade, thus with many Americans suffering under British oppression, the First Continental Congress met in Philadelphia in September of that year. Delegates including George Washington and Patrick Henry of Virginia, John and Samuel Adams of Massachusetts, and John Jay of New York petitioned to King George III to repeal the intolerable acts. However, when no response was given, the New England militia began drilling for war. In an attempt to suppress the growing unrest, the British commander-in-chief at Boston, General Thomas Gage, ordered a force to seize the arms stores at the town of Concord, some 20 miles to the northwest of Boston. Thus, on the night of April 18, 1775, a British force departed Boston under the cover of darkness in the hope that their movements would go unnoticed. However, patriots within the city walls signalled from the Old North Church to the patriots Paul Revere, William Dawes and Samuel Prescott who were waiting across the river in Charlestown about the British plan. Immediately, the three patriots took off into the night, alerting every town between Boston and Concord that the British were coming. Answering the call to arms, minute men from all over New England sprung into action, and when the British force arrived at the town of Lexington on the morning of April 19, 1775, they quickly found that their path was blocked. As tensions mounted between the small band of minute men and the British troops on Lexington Green, a shot was fired, sparking a skirmish which left several Americans dead and caused the rest to flee. Who fired the famous shot heard around the world is still not known. However, one thing was for certain, and that was that the American Revolution had truly begun. In the ensuing battle of Lexington and Concord, the British were soundly beaten by overwhelming numbers of militia, and subsequently were forced to retreat back to Boston. Soon after in May of 1775, the Second Continental Congress convened, with more delegates from all corners of the colonies, such as Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, rallying to the cause. Understanding the threat the British Army posed, the Congress promptly voted in favour of forming a new Continental Army, with George Washington appointed as its Commander-in-Chief. Unfortunately, Washington would not take command of the Army before its first major battle of the war, as on June 17, 1775, in an attempt to break out of Boston, 
which was now under siege by colonial forces, General Gage ordered the newly arrived force under General Sir William Howe to capture the Charlestown Heights and drive the Americans back. In the often misleading title of the Battle of Bunker Hill, Howe's force, while suffering horrendous casualties, won a strategic victory and succeeded in their task of driving the Americans from Breed's Hill. However, the disproportionate casualty rate between the two sides lent encouragement to the Americans and was seen as a moral victory for the revolutionary cause. Finally, on July 3rd, Washington assumed command of the Continental Army, but a tough winter saw him struggle to contain the British in Boston while simultaneously trying to recruit and train men on the march. Though relief soon came, when the artillery pieces captured by Colonel Ethan Allen and the Vermont militia at Fort Ticonderoga arrived in late winter, with cannon fire now raining down on Boston and the British from Dorchester Heights, General Howe, who had now replaced Gage, realised that his position had become untenable, and ordered a withdrawal from the city to Canada on March 17, 1776. By June of that year, the Revolutionary War was in full swing. Now the Continental Congress was set not only on winning the war, but also securing independence for the colonies. Thus, on July 4th, 1776, they voted to adopt the Declaration of Independence, which had been drafted by a five-man committee comprising of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. Hell-bent on putting an end to the revolution and the notion of an independent America, the British sent a force of 34,000 men from Halifax to New York by sea, and on July 5th, they made camp on Staten Island. Washington quickly marched his army down in response, but he was soundly beaten on August 27th at the Battle of Long Island and forced to retreat. Now with the arrival of the British General Charles Cornwallis's force and a swift victory at Fort Lee on November 24th, Washington's position seemed hopeless. His army was driven across New Jersey by British superiority and eventually they were forced to flee across the Delaware River. Believing the Americans were done for, Howe encamped his force for the winter and set up outposts at Bordentown and Trenton. However, in a stroke of genius, on Christmas night 1776, Washington snuck his force back across the Delaware and launched a surprise attack on the overconfident British at Trenton. By daybreak, nearly 1,000 British soldiers had been taken prisoner by the Continental Army. Though this victory was short-lived, as Cornwallis retook Trenton on January 2nd and very nearly trapped Washington's army in the process. Not one to back down easily, Washington hit back immediately with a stunning victory at Princeton a day later. Although the heavy fighting had taken its toll, soon after the Americans made winter quarters at Morristown, like the British, they endeavoured to regroup for another year of brutal combat. British strategy in 1777 centred around a two-pronged attack in an effort to drive a wedge between the fiercely patriotic North and the more passive Southern colonies. Therefore, General John Burgoyne and his force marched south from Canada to link up with Howe's force on the Hudson River. En route, Burgoyne's force dealt a devastating blow to the Americans when they recaptured Fort Ticonderoga on July 5th and believing Burgoyne was now strong enough to operate on his own, Howe decided to seek out Washington's army on his own. At first, Howe's decision seemed to be an inspired one, as on September 11th, after landing his forces at Chesapeake Bay, his forces mauled Washington's army at the Battle of Brandywine Creek. More success quickly followed, when on September 25th, the British marched into the American capital of Philadelphia. Washington tried to hit back on October 4th at Germantown, but he was once again beaten and forced to withdraw to Valley Forge for the winter. It would seem that Howe's plan had worked. However, the rapid move south had left Burgoyne's force dangerously exposed, and at Freeman's Farm, the American forces under the command of General Horatio Gates and Benedict Arnold pressed home the advantage. On September 19th, 
in what would come to be known as the First Battle of Saratoga, Gates' force dealt a heavy blow to the British. Then, soon after, on October 7th, at Bemis Heights, Arnold's force dealt a knockout blow in the Second Battle of Saratoga. Ten days later, on October 17th, Burgoyne and the shattered remnants of his army surrendered, and to make matters worse for the British, the American victory prompted France to openly join the war on the American side. Though the formal declaration of war against Britain was not announced until June of 1778, it was now evident that the tides of war were beginning to change. The bitterly cold winter at Valley Forge became one of survival for the Continental Army, as mismanagement of food supplies by the quartermasters led to food shortages and starvation. Morale and discipline soon plummeted amongst the troops, but upon the arrival of the Marquis de Lafayette and the Baron Friedrich von Steuben, conditions began to improve. Sent to help train Washington's men, von Steuben quickly went to work and emphasised the importance of officer drilling and firearm efficiency to the men. Their new skill set soon paid off, when on June 28, 1778, Washington's force held the formidable force of Sir Henry Clinton, who had replaced General Howe, to a draw at Monmouth, New Jersey. Despite this, Clinton was able to safely complete the withdrawal of his troops to New York, but much to his annoyance on July 8th, the French fleet arrived off the Atlantic coast. In an attempt to press home their advantage, the joint Franco-American force attacked the British at Newport, Rhode Island in July. However, the formidable British defences could not be breached, and the war in the north settled into a stalemate. A potentially serious blow to the American cause was dealt when Benedict Arnold, the hero of Saratoga, defected to the British side in 1780, marking a low point in a series of setbacks suffered by the Americans between 1779 and 1781. Mutinies were rife as soldiers of the Continental Army were issued poor food and clothing and were regularly owed well-earned pay. These trying times were further compounded by a series of defeats as the war spread to the south. By the end of January 1779, Georgia was in British hands, and the following year, Charleston, South Carolina fell, and with it virtually the whole Continental Army in the South. Things continued to get worse, as Cornwallis demolished Gates' army at the Battle of Camden in August of 1780. But when all hope was lost, the Americans took solace in a fine victory at King's Mountain on October 7th. Spurred on by this ray of hope, the Americans yet again scored an outstanding victory at the Battle of Cowpens in January 1781 where General Daniel Morgan's force, acting under the order of Gates' replacement Nathaniel Green, trapped the fearsome force of British Colonel Tarleton near the Broad River and virtually destroyed it. With momentum building, General Green then attempted to take Cornwallis's force head-on at Guilford Courthouse, North Carolina, on March 15th. However, his attack was stopped dead in its tracks by British superiority. The war in the southern colonies was fought with a tremendous brutality and both sides suffered heavy losses. However, reinforcements for the Continental Army and the local militias could arrive at the front in a matter of days, whereas the British had to bring more troops across the Atlantic Ocean, which took up valuable time, time the British could ill afford. And, with the Spanish also joining the war on the American side in 1779, Britain had to protect its own home borders in Europe, Thus, reinforcements to America soon dried up, and the British strength of arms slowly diminished. By the fall of 1781, the tides of war had well and truly turned in favour of the Americans. In the south, Cornwallis's weakened force withdrew to the Yorktown Peninsula in Virginia to await the arrival of Clinton's relief force by sea. However, when the French fleet blocked the coast and Washington's Franco-American force, commanded by General Jean-Baptiste de Rochambeau, took up siege positions around Yorktown, the British were trapped. Realising Clinton's relief force would not come and that his position was now untenable, Cornwallis surrendered on October 19, 1781. Embarrassed 
and pleading illness, Cornwallis refused to personally surrender his sword to Washington and sent his second-in-command, General Charles O'Hara, in his stead. Though a resounding victory, Yorktown was not the end of the war. For in Charleston the British still held power, and further north a formidable British force still occupied New York. Despite their presence, major actions between both armies were avoided, and in late 1782 the British realised that the war could not be won, and began evacuating their final strongholds. Soon after, all land action died out as British and American negotiators met in Paris that November. Almost a year later on September 3rd, 1783, Great Britain signed the Treaty of Paris, finally recognising America's independence and drawing the Revolutionary War to a close.